Hello, everybody. This is Patrice. We'll start in about two minutes. Hello everyone, this is Elke. We'll get started in just a few minutes. everybody. It is now noon. This is Patrice Burgess, um, the chair of the group, and we have a very busy agenda, so we'll kind of get started and talk you through what we've got going on today. Thank you all for joining and for all of your work reviewing. Uh, next slide, please. Elke, did you want to say anything else this morning before we move on? Sorry, right. I'm getting some messages that some people are having some hard times getting on the, the WebEx today, so I was trying to manage that. Um, yes, welcome everyone. We appreciate you being here today. And uh, as mentioned, we have an, a very much an action-packed agenda today. Lots to go through, lots of actions to take, so we're just going to start right in on our agenda straight away. So thanks, Patrice. All right, next slide, please. So I think uh, in, if, unless you've not been reading the newspaper or watching TV, uh, you should already know that we received our first uh, vaccine, which is very exciting as we've been uh, working on this group. Sometimes it felt like it was a long way away, but on December 14th, we got our first shipment from Pfizer um, that after they received their emergency use authorization from the FDA. Um, I think you all know we expected to get a few more doses, but the, the amount changed to 13,650 and has been distributed among the different health districts and to the two systems that have the ultra cold storage that you see there. And uh, we have a new section of our website, the coronavirus.idaho.gov website. When you go to that landing page, there's a nice big blue box, I think, uh, in the middle that tells you how many vaccines have been administered so far. So that's the same page where we have our vaccine tab with a lot of information about this committee um, or the same website, not the same page. But if you want to keep up with how many vaccines have been given, that's the place to go. So next slide, please. And I get the fun opportunity to say a huge thank you to um, some of our CVAC members that are also our frontline workers. Um, Dr. Patrice Burgess, Dr. White, and Dr. Davids, all on your advisory committee, um, all showing their um, vaccination that they got this last week, this last week, so it's very exciting. And as your executive secretary, I'm also going to take advantage of you all and show the next slide so I can call out another great frontline worker if you'll advance the slides for me. And my sister, <laughs> who also got her vaccine today. So I was very proud of her for doing that. And she didn't get the chance to get a, a, a photo of actually getting the injection, but she's got her little vaccine card. And so I just wanted to um, say thank you to all of those of you who are doing this hard work, frontline um, healthcare workers. Uh, we really appreciate everything that you're doing and stepping forward. So the next slide. We'll... 
send it back to Patrice. So, so this is uh, Patrice again. Just to review, um, you know, kind of the work of our group. First of all, remember our role, which is uh, prioritizing the vaccines when they're in limited supply. Uh, communicating and delivering the vaccine, and then making sure there's equitable access across the state and all the demographic groups, and that we're advisory to the governor. Um, but just kind of to ground ourselves on what we've done so far since we began, is we agreed to accept early distribution of the vaccine at our cold, ultra cold storage facilities. We've sub prioritized the health care personnel and long term care facility groups, and we sub prioritized the essential worker group. And we recommended activating the CDC pharmacy long-term care facility partnership. So that's what we've already done, but we still have work to do. <clears throat> so as you'll learn today, uh, we've received a lot of input, some of which you see that comes through the public email, but some of which comes directly to either the governor or the health department. So today we're gonna do some clarification of the some some of the subgroups that we've already reviewed and just clarify and vote on those. And it'll make more sense when you see uh, what that feedback was. So we'll go over that. Some of it you've already seen, some of it you haven't. And then uh, we know ASIP will be having some uh, further priority groups. And so we'll be having to review those, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. And then we'll probably need to go through the same process that we're doing today to clarify the healthcare worker group, to clarify the essential worker group, and then again, sub-prioritize future phases as they come out from the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. So we've done quite a bit, but we still have quite a bit to do, including today's action-packed agenda. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to, to mention um, about our public comment option. So as always, our meetings are open to the public. They're in listen-only mode. We are taking public comments, um, but they'll be accepted in writing to the email address that's shown on this slide. And the email address is, in case you're just listening in and not able to see the slides, is COVID-19 vaccine public comment all spelled out. So C-O-V-I-D, the number 19, vaccine public comment, all one word, at dhw.idaho.gov. Uh, the comments that we receive through this inbox, <clears throat> excuse me, are distributed to the CVAC members. But I wanted to note a bit of a process change since we've started this, um, the advisory committee, um, because we want to make sure that as CVAC members receive comments that they are in alignment with our meetings and what we're presenting to you. So we are um, asking that uh, the comments that we receive by 5 p.m. on the Monday prior to a CVAC meeting will be forwarded to CVAC members. We were operating under comments would come in 24 hours before the meeting, we would send them off to you, but we've had a struggle with preparing our presentations with the most current information and then um, sending more comments and then the presentations don't necessarily match the cadence of the input coming in, if that makes sense. So all comments will still make their way there, but we'll have a better ability to bundle them and present them um, if we have that, that time frame on there. So this is not losing any public comment or any ability to respond, it's just changing that, that timing in which things are um, <clears throat> seeing that the things are sent out. I also want to, in case you haven't noticed, we do have um, an ASL interpreter now, a sign language interpreter, um, providing support to our meetings. And uh, if you see, there's a video that is pinned at the top of the screen. And should you need that video larger, as you can see on the slide, you can click on the layout option in your upper right hand corner and then click on full screen. So once the full screen appears, there's a floating window the panelists will show and you can increase the video size by dragging and expanding. So the, the um, instructions are right there on this slide. If you need um, that information pulled back up for you as we move through um, the presentations, please feel free to add that in the chat. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn it over to Monica, our facilitator. Thank you, LT. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to have you all here today, our CVAC members, our attendees, everybody who's here. Thank you. It's certainly been an eventful week. And as you've heard, that reflects our agenda as well. We have a very full agenda. 
and uh, we'll get onto that in just a moment. I wanted to double check again that everybody is receiving the materials that are going out. Everybody in terms of the CVAC members are receiving materials in between meetings. If you are not, please reach out to one of us and we'll make sure that we remedy that for you because we wanna make sure you're receiving everything in a timely manner. Next, I want to acknowledge everybody who's here today uh, at the meeting. Our CVAC members are in that panelist list that you'll see possibly in the right-hand side of your screen. Of course, of course we have folks across um, in video as well. Please take a look at that. I know that Daryl Anderson let me know that he is on phone only for the beginning of the meeting, but he is here with us and will be on video shortly. I also noticed that we have Elise Alford uh, as a designee for Alicia Esty today. And uh, if there are any other designees that uh, we are not already aware of, if you wouldn't mind putting that in the chat, that'd be fantastic. And I wanna pause briefly to see if there's anyone else on phone only because we can't see you on the list, just so we can acknowledge that you're here as well. So anyone who's just on the phone, um, any uh, member who's just on the phone, if you could unmute your phone and quickly let us know you're here. Okay, I'm not hearing anyone right now. Uh, so I'm gonna keep moving uh, so that we can uh, get on with the other topics today. All right, if we could get to the next uh, slide, please. I'm gonna quickly review the agenda for today. You've all seen this. Uh, we sent out a slightly amended version yesterday, just as things are rapidly moving forward, we need to update things sometimes. Uh, we are going to first hear from Sarah Leeds on vaccine program updates. And then we'll hear from Dr. Hahn on the latest uh, uh, I ACIP recommendations. Then we're gonna turn to that item that Dr. Burgess talked about earlier, the clarification of subgroup prioritizations and some votes. So we'll be asking our voting members to weigh, on, weigh in on several things actually. Um, and we'll have lots more details for you when we get there. But the intent is not to redo the work that's already been done, but just to further refine some things uh, based on some of the feedback that uh, comes in from our stakeholders. Next slide. Then we will hear from Amy Gamet, who is one of our CVAC members, and she will be giving us an update on what's going on at the public health districts with regard to vaccine distribution and so forth. Finally, we'll hear from Dr. Bridges on vaccine safety and effectiveness, a topic that I'm sure we're all very interested in. And with that, we'll move into the wrap up and talk about our schedule moving forward and next steps. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sarah Leeds. Actually, sorry, I missed my slide here. Let's quickly orient to our functions. I know you've seen this one before, but very quickly, of course, that reminder to mute, unmute when you're ready to speak, keep your video on if you possibly can. We'll be using the hands up for anyone who wants to provide verbal comment and we'll just acknowledge you wanted a time to keep that moving forward uh, clearly and uh, efficiently. We'll be using the chat below. And of course we have uh, Kathy Turner and Dr. Hahn, uh, both monitoring the chat for us, which is extremely helpful. And then of course, where you see the, the arrow here to the megaphone button, this will be very important today. We'll be using it a lot. So please make sure you've located that because we'll be taking a lot of quick votes. We'll have several to move through. So we wanna be efficient in that today. So that will be used for our um, voting today. I don't believe we'll have any poll questions today, but that's always a possibility as well. And also before I forget, the bottoms of your agendas that were sent out in advance, we'll have a review of those ground rules, both general ground rules to help us have a very effective meeting and uh, remote meeting specific ground rules. And with that, I think we're ready to turn it over to Sarah Leeds for vaccine program updates. Thank you so much, Monica. So I have titled today's presentation, uh, COVID-19, An Epic Week and Other Adventures in Pandemic Immunization. Um, just to kind of emphasize, uh, you know, how, how this is such a, a changing landscape and, and how, how, how nimble we remain and have been and that uh, as, as things change, we adjust and that is just the nature of, of what we're doing. And, and it does kind of feel like an epic adventure. So um, this was such a great week. Um, I would like to uh, give an acknowledgement to our CVAC member, uh, Amy Gamet. She gave the very first dose uh, administered in Idaho. So uh, congratulations on that, Amy. That's really a, a pretty, pretty fun uh, 
thing to be able to say you did. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so I have a few topics I want to talk about. Um, of course, we've already mentioned, but I'll give you a little more detail about the arrival of COVID vaccine in Idaho, the uh, Pfizer Bio BioNTech um, vaccine, um, some uh, very initial metrics, um, talk about the pharmacy partnership uh, for long-term care program and some uh, things that we had to react very quickly to this week. Um, talk about the coming uh, dose allocations in the coming week and also some communications. In this slide, you can see uh, the Pfizer uh, BioNTech uh, thermal shipper. And that, that's kind of what that looks like. And down in the middle of that is, um, is that infamous pizza box or the tray of of 975 doses. <clears throat> so um, next slide, please. Um, here again is uh, just confirmation that this week, all 300, and, or 300, all 13,650 doses arrived in Idaho. Um, there's some pictures from our various uh, immunization providers who uh, were so great about uh, taking pictures and sharing with us the uh, picture over on the left of your screen is uh, that that pizza box, that tray of vials going into an ultra cold freezer. Um, this the lower left hand picture is the thermal shipping container being opened. And that little device uh, is is the uh, the GPS tracker that Pfizer puts into every thermal shipping container. It's also a temperature monitor. Um, and and when they open that temperature monitor, uh, they, they, they turn it off so that then a message goes to Pfizer that the vaccine has arrived and, and been kind of accepted. Um, and the nice thing about that is that when providers who are using the, the thermal shipping container as their storage for, for the vaccine, for the time that they're allowed to, for up to 30 days, they can turn that, <coughs> excuse me, that unit back on and use it as the temperature monitor. Um, this middle bigger picture, you can see uh, the into the thermal shipping container and those dry ice pellets, which I did not know prior to this effort and planning effort that dry ice came in pellets like that. So always a learning opportunity. Um, and then there's another picture on the right hand side of the pizza box and being taken out and then um, there's a picture of a friend of mine over in Southeast Idaho who works in the lab at the hospital in Southeast Idaho um, getting her vaccine and she gave me permission to put that picture in. Um, okay, next slide, please. So just some initial metrics. Um, we have 175 vaccination uh, locations enrolled as of the 16th. Um, and at, as of that same date, we have another 44 locations in the enrollment process and, and soon to be completed. Um, and as of the 17th, as of yesterday, um, this is the <clears throat> the kind of the, the button dashboard you'll see um, on the coronavirus.idaho.gov uh, page. Uh, as of yesterday morning, 944 doses have been reported into IRIS, our immunization registry for the state. And um, I personally really like the fact that um, the doses administered button is on top of the cases and the deaths. I feel like that's, to me, that is just such a sign of so much hope. So um, it's exciting. And just to clarify, um, there may be, I just want folks to know that it, this button of 944, the number will show uh, doses administered in iris. And so there is a little bit of a lag time in reporting in that um, every provider who administers doses has uh, 24 hours uh, to get them into their electronic health system and then an additional 72 hours to get them into iris. So um, so while it's, it's, it's somewhat real time, it's not exactly real time um, and that there is a delay in, in, um, in what we know. So <clears throat> just want to point that out to folks. Next slide, please. Some of the other things that we are doing to prepare uh, everyone, all our vaccinators uh, to be ready for vaccinating, not just with the Pfizer 
uh, BioNTech product, but also um, upcoming Moderna. Um, we are providing education for webinars every week um, at these times for immunization providers with uh, information about storage and handling, administration. Next week, um, we'll be training on prep mod um, and some other topics. So, and then we also have uh, virtual office hours every Wednesday for providers where we will maybe have you know some updates for the first five, uh, 10 to 15 minutes, and then just an opportunity for providers to ask questions. Um, next slide, please. Uh, after <clears throat> last weekend, after the the Pfizer vaccine was approved, uh, or the EUA was issued, and then ACIP. Uh, issued their recommendation, we were able to, at the immunization program, we were able to finally put in writing a lot of the uh, details about the Pfizer vaccine that we could not, um, we didn't have from Pfizer because of legalities we, in writing. So that, that went live over the weekend, <clears throat> and there's quite a bit of information for, for our vaccine providers, and I've included the, web, <clears throat> the website, it's within the department's website, um, the address is at the top of this slide, but if you um, look at the next slide, please, there's an easier way to get to it, I think, um, rather than navigating through the department's website. Um, if you go to coronavirus.idaho.gov, <clears throat> on the left slot side, you can see uh, where you would click to get to the slide or the page that's now then on the right side of our slide. And then those red arrows point to the provider information page that you saw on the previous slide. So it's just two clicks away if you go to Idaho, coronavirus.idaho.gov. And that might be a little easier than navigating to the page just out of Google. So next slide, please. So just a reminder about the pharmacy, the, law, the pharmacy partnership for long-term care program. Um, this, this information is a little bit similar to a slide you saw uh, last time when we were asking you to make a recommendation as to when we, Idaho, would activate the Pharmacy Partnership Program. So just as a reminder, the, the program is a federal program providing end-to-end -end management of COVID-19 vaccination um, at long-term care facilities. And that is, the we're using that broad term to include skilled nursing facilities, assisted living, and then residential assisted living facilities. And that is a contractual agreement between CDC with Walgreens and CVS. Um, and so with that agreement, um, CVS and Walgreens are taking care of all everything related to um, vaccine administration at, at uh, long-term care facilities. So that includes the cold chain management, the vaccination on site, all the reporting requirements, including getting doses entered into IRIS. Um, and it, it, the intent was to really um, take, the, take the burden off of long-term care facilities and also state and local public health jurisdictions vaccination of those populations. <clears throat> and next slide, please. So if, if you remember, we, we recommended, you, you all recommended and the governor um, approved, that um, we would activate the pharmacy partnership program in week two of our vaccination effort, which would be this week. <clears throat> and we had been working on estimates of Pfizer vaccine. Um, our deadline to give notice, we, uh, if you remember, we have to give two weeks notice. And so the deadline to activate uh, using our week two dose allocations was Monday. And so Idaho met this deadline. Uh, we gave notice to CDC to activate the pharmacy partnership program, um, and which meant that beginning next week, the week of December 21st, um, our Pfizer BioNTech allocations would begin being pulled from our state allocation and moved into the pharmacy partnership allocation for, for Idaho. And that Walgreens and CVS would begin <clears throat> vaccinating on December 28th. Next slide, please. And just to give you a comparison of where Idaho falls with the rest of the country, as of the 14th, um, this was uh, a, the states that chose either Pfizer 
or Moderna and which week they wanted to uh, start vaccinating. And so you can see that the darker green states um, are starting to vaccinate, chose to vaccinate starting next week with their Pfizer allocations. The lighter green, which Idaho is one, um, is chose to vaccinate starting on the 28th of December. Um, and then those blue states are vaccinating with Moderna. Um, interestingly enough, you see a couple gray states, um, West Virginia being one of them. Um, they didn't activate their program. And we heard a presentation yesterday during a um, Association of Immunization Managers meeting that they just took care of the program on their own and, um, and it was quite successful. So they opted out completely. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting the way every state is choosing to do it a little bit differently. Next slide, please. So we had a little bit of a roller coaster this week with our Pfizer allocations. Um, Wednesday, uh, we learned that um, nationally, there was a pretty significant reduction in Pfizer doses for week two. And uh, just, just you know, full disclosure, our, our, our allocation that we had been working with for well over a week um, was 17,550 doses. We had always known that was an estimate, but we were fairly confident in it because it had stayed stable for, for more than a week. Um, but Wednesday, we learned that it had been reduced, Idaho's allocation had been reduced to 9,750 doses for next week. And that has some pretty significant implications for um, our vaccination program, as it does with every other state that's experiencing this reduction. Um, and as just to kind of recap, um, I would not expect you to remember these details. <laughs> um, so the, the requirements originally had been for our first week of activation, meaning week two. So next week we needed to have 50% of the needed doses transferred from our state allocation over to the uh, pharmacy partnership program. And um, Idaho's needed doses for this program are um, a little over 30,000 doses. And um, then the second week, they would take 25% of the needed doses. And then the third week, another 25%. But now, now that our doses have um, been reduced, CDC changed the requirements. And so rather than that 50%, 25%, 25% uh they have broken it down to 25% transfer over a four week period. So they've um, so what that actually means for Idaho is that we will have 7,800 doses transferred from our Pfizer allocation to the pharmacy partnership program next week, starting next week, and then the follow the same amount the following three weeks. So a four week period of 7,800 doses going into that partnership program. So we, we chose to continue with the activation of it. But the implications of that are that our Pfizer doses, the remaining admit that we have to ship to um, or to distribute to sites that are vaccinating healthcare workers is only two trays, um, 1,950 doses. And that's incredibly disappointing, um, but it's what we are dealing with right now. Um, we are hoping because everything changes so quickly that maybe that will maybe that will change for the positive. But we at this point we we don't know that. So this is what we're working with. Um, next slide, please. The good news is that next week we have confirmed that uh, we have 28,000 doses of the Moderna vaccine coming into Idaho, um, and that is of course assuming that everything goes smoothly with the issuance of an EUA and the ACIP recommendations. Go that all goes as anticipated. Um, and the nice thing about that is that uh, Moderna comes in shipments of 100 doses and also uh, does not require the ultra cold storage. So it is um, both a little easier logistically to dis dispense and distribute and administer to providers around the state and also um, to the storage and handling requirements are a little uh, easier for everyone to deal with. Next slide. So I just want to um, show this slide because I think it's really important. We are hearing uh, that some misinformation is going on out there. Um, 
some providers are are saying that they they should be withholding doses for that second dose too. Um, it is absolutely not the case. Um, the 13,650 doses we have in Idaho are dose one. They're all for dose one. And we will get um, a distribution during the week of January 4th to be administered um, follow, you know, 21 days after everyone got their vaccine this week um, for dose two. So if you ever hear of a provider saying to withhold those doses in their current shipment, please, please try to dispel that and help us dispel that myth. Um, this is kind of the, the way that the shipping in the second dose goes. So this is week one, if you look at that. So I keep using my mouse as if you're using looking at my screen, but you're not. Um, I need a, I feel like I need a pointer. Um, week one, um, you know, we're, right now week one is what we're in and we have 13,650 doses. So in week three, um, the second dose will ship. So dose two for all the people who got their dose this week, that will ship. And what that will mean, this is a CDC slide that's a little outdated because um, it includes rollover and uh, we do not anticipate having rollover right now. Um, rollover meaning that um, doses are allocated to Idaho in a week, but we may, maybe wouldn't have ordered them or distributed them. Um, and so they're kind of sitting in our bank and I just have in there that like, it, think of it like a, a bank account balance that we could draw against. So um, right with the situation we're dealing with right now, especially with Pfizer, um, there won't be any rollover um, unless we were to see a huge increase in our allocations. So that, that kind of is the way the flow will go. Week two, we'll have another round of doses. Um, <laughs> so we anticipate both, both Nick in week two, um, the two trays of Pfizer being available to our vaccine providers with all those other doses having been moved over to the pharmacy partnership program. Uh, and that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with. We don't, um, there'll be no rollover from week one. Um, and then you'll, you kind of see the cadence that starting in week three, we'll get the second dose. We'll get an allocation, a week three allocation, which is in that purple font. <clears throat> the blue font is the is for this for Idaho. That is that week one second dose would be thirteen thousand six hundred and fifty doses of Pfizer, plus any rollover. Um, and again, we don't anticipate rollover. We anticipate being able to allocate all those Moderna doses next week, and of course the two trays of Pfizer. <laughs> next slide, please. Um, communications is another uh, piece that uh, is 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 quite a, a, a heavy lift for all of us. Um, we are getting communications out through social media. We're doing Facebook Live. Um, we have a, a blog. Uh, the department has a blog. We have uh, we are answering questions as much as we are able to with print and broadcast media. Um, we are putting out frequently asked questions documents, um, and we have a. a communications uh, committee that is um, putting out, you know, we have education on vaccine, vaccine safety, vaccine hesitancy, um, trying to answer questions about the details related to Idaho specifically, like how will I know when I can get my second, or when I get my vaccine, um, where the dose is being shipped in Idaho, and how much vaccine is Idaho getting? So those are consistent questions that our, our communications office is getting that we re routinely answer. And then I think a big thing we are we are trying to deal with is refuting um, the vaccine misinformation that gets circulated out there. And it changes all the time. And, and it's we are it's, it's a very responsive kind of uh, communication, which is a challenge. So that those are the things that we are uh, hyper focused on, um, along with other things. So uh, next slide. The next, our next steps over the next few weeks and months are to continue um, enrolling providers, uh, continuing provider education. We anticipate that those webinars and office hours will continue for quite some time. Um, <clears throat> we are advocating as much as we can for increased allocations. 
as are all our other counterparts in the states around the country. Um, we are developing a dashboard for vaccination data uh, that will be added to the coronavirus.idaho.gov page, and that should be up soon. And again, more communications and education. And next slide is just a placeholder for questions and discussion. We have a couple yeah. of questions. And we have a hand up, uh, Amy Gamet. Yes, Sarah, this is Amy. Um, on those provider enrollment agreements, do you know about how far those are out? We have a few of our providers here asking us. And then when will the health districts be aware of additional enrollers um, in their districts just for planning purposes? Well, sure. So so uh, we are up, up to, I don't know how far out we are. I will have to, I will try to, when I stop talking, I will text our um, our vaccine operations manager and and see if I can get that answer and I'll post it in the chat. Um, but to answer your second question about how you how how the districts know um, we are uh, daily uh, Monday through Friday uploading um, the completed provider information to SharePoint sites um, within the preparedness program SharePoint sites. So as you check those spreadsheets daily, you should get an updated list. And there are two tabs. There's a completed one, and I think uh, the other one that has an orange tab in it is um, in process. Okay, we just we have somebody that thinks or they're reporting that they're completely enrolled, and I did not see that in SharePoint. SharePoint, but I can reach out specifically on them. Yeah, that'd be great. Excellent, thank you. Let's take a look at the chat. Um, can we get a report on chat chat questions? Yeah, Monica, um, we have quite a few questions. Um, the first one is that, the, well, there was a comment that about counting Pfizer trade doses as six doses per vial, um, and there was some discussion in the chat. Um, Sarah, can you speak a little bit to the um, question about inventory and accounting for the fact that they may get, um, they may be able to get six doses instead of five doses per vial? Yes, yeah. so our our guidance from CDC so far is uh, to, from, well, from Pfizer as well, is to, because we're in an emergency situation uh, and, and their doses are in limited supply, <clears throat> that providers should go ahead and take that sixth dose. And sometimes we're hearing there's potentially even a seventh dose in there um, and go ahead and administer that. Um, and we are expecting some con confirmation guidance from CDC about that soon, but they've, they've through email, let us know um, to, to go for, to let providers know that they should use those doses. Right. I would, say, I would like to clarify one thing, though, because um, it, I think it should seem obvious, but um, just want to make it very clear that providers should never, ever uh, open that vial or and two vials to try to combine any remaining vaccine um, that is absolutely not okay. Thanks, Sarah. So we will still not be counting our Pfizer trays, assuming there's an extra dose. It will still be counted as five dose vials. All right, great. That's Thank correct. you. That's correct. And I would also add that the immunization program um, is getting information out about how that affects inventory in IRS. <clears throat> and and to not worry about that, to just go ahead and and use that dose if it's there at this point, and don't don't worry about the inventory. We will we can fix that in Iris. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, um, question from Dr. Wyatt: Why did the Why did the state us decide to use Pfizer um, for long term care facilities instead of Moderna, given logistical challenges of Pfizer? Um, well, I can answer some of that, at least from my perspective, and maybe um, some of our leadership can add to that if, I, if I'm missing something. But what some of the considerations we 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 took we took into consideration were that um, the pharmacy partnership program, Walgreens and CVS, could was better poised to quickly use 975 doses, um, and that logistically is actually 
we thought made it better for us to distribute 100 do dose shipments to our providers. Um, we also know that con contractually, um, Walgreens and CD CBS are um, able to handle the cold chain um, aspects of the Pfizer, uh, Pfizer presentation. Great. Um, and then, Sarah, can you discuss a little bit about um, if providers have already received the, the Pfizer vaccine, um, are they still going to be able to receive both Pfizer and Moderna? Or can you just um, discuss briefly what that, that looks like in the future, assuming that Moderna gets their EUA um, approved? Yeah, yeah. So, so we at the immunization program, um, we're trying to keep one presentation dis distribution to a provider. And that was to really, um, the intent was to keep the, just because they're both new, keep that uh, complex, keep those complexities to a minimum. And so that providers could just get used to the one uh, presentation. But knowing it, we will absolutely honor um, the districts, especially as we work with them on distribution in their regions, um, we are working with them. And if it's a matter of getting doses to providers that are needed and them both, them having both presentations, we will do that. But um, it was our it was our hope to to have enough allocation that we could do that. But um, at least right now, it's not looking like we can do that. So but it's just going to be um, very, very imperative on providers that you know, they check the registry to make sure every patient, um, they know which dose one every patient had. Um, and so, you know, just the use of the registry is gonna be paramount, um, if, especially when they're working with two, the two different presentations. Great. Um, and then um, um, Natalie, could you move back to the slide that um, shows the um, immunization programs office hours? Um, I'm not sure which slide number it was, there we go. So um, a reminder that any that those of you on CVAC that would like to hear more detail about some of these topics, um, kind of the nuts and bolts, um, the immunization program does have um, virtual office hours for providers every Wednesday at noon. And those um, the information on those can be accessed on the websites that we were also pointed to. And I think we have a slide on the on those links, Natalie. But I don't remember which one it was. Sarah, do you remember? It is slide. There we go. There yeah. we go. Yep. There we go. So um, you are welcome to attend office hours, um, and some of these nuts and bolts questions will definitely get answered during that time. Um, there is a, a really important question. What is the plan for vaccinating long-term care facility residents and staff in communities that do not have a CVS or Walgreens pharmacy? Will CVS and Walgreens send vaccinators to those communities? We know that uh, Walgreens and CVS have committed to vaccinating any facility that enrolled in the program. So um, to, to, to repeat from last time, um, a facility, a long-term care facility or skilled nursing facility, it was on, they had the responsibility to enroll in the program so if they enrolled and the Walgreens and CVS is with a, within a 75 mile radius, Walgreens and CVS are contractually obligated to take care of that. Um, that said, we are working with, with facilities, with the health districts to identify um, any, any long-term care sites that maybe didn't get enrolled or didn't complete the enrollment um, to ensure that we know what provider they want to vaccinate their residents and staff and get them enrolled. So it's sort of a parallel paths of, of, of strategy to get them vaccinated. Thank you, Sarah. I'm gonna jump in here. This is Monica. For time purposes, I'm sure we, we may have some other questions in the chat, but we have a lot to get through today. So um, I would encourage everyone to use those resources and the office hours that were shared today, the provider office hours. Uh, for technical questions. And if we can get to any other questions as we move through today, we certainly will. But for now, we're gonna move to the next item on our agenda, which is uh, Dr. Han uh, uh, filling us on, uh, on the ACIP recommendations. 
Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so just as we go into some of the meat of our meeting where we're going to be um, looking at um, the prioritization groups as they now stand and some questions that have come up, we wanted to just uh, make sure and make sure everybody's aware of the exact language of what the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices has recommended to CDC and what CDC has uh, adopted as their recommendations. So I'm just going to do a quick background really before we move on uh, to the the meat of the discussion and 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 uh, votes for the meeting. Uh, next slide, please. So as a reminder, these were initially published December 3rd, but then were as a kind of an early release, uh, but then republished as a final um, recommendation on December 11th. So as a reminder, and this is not related to any particular vaccine. So these are general recommendations about the, the priority groups for vaccination. And ASIP recommended that once vaccine was available, healthcare personnel and residents of long-term care facilities should be offered vaccination in the initial phase of the program. And there was also a note here that these this, these recommendations can might be updated uh, based on any new safety or efficacy data um, coming out of the FDA as the process moves forward. Next slide. So in that MMWR, healthcare personnel are defined as paid and unpaid persons serving in healthcare settings who have the potential for direct or indirect exposure to patients or infectious materials. Long-term care facility residents are defined as adults who reside in facilities that provide this range of services, including medical and personal care to persons unable to live independently. Next slide. So um, last uh, Saturday, uh, ASIP um, voted on this question, and this is the question that came before the committee. They had, they had discussions on Friday and Saturday, and the vote was held Saturday. Should this vaccine, the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID vaccine, be recommended for persons 16 years of age and older under an emergency use authorization? And just as a reminder for folks, the EUA allows people 16 and 17 years of age to be vaccinated, but that is not, of course, our, the, the focus of current population of, of vaccination efforts. Um, it was felt that it was important uh, to include this in even in the initial recommendation because uh, healthcare facilities could have employees or volunteers in that age group. Next slide. And so uh, CDC adopted these as their recommendations on, and it was published in the MWR on the 13th. Um, and I've sent, I've given you two links there. Uh, one is the link right to that MMWR you see there, but also I just, the second link shows uh, they're going to have a, a page, a CDC page where all these vaccines um, as we expect Moderna and others to eventually join the list of, of vaccines available, uh, they'll all be compiled on this site. So uh, we'll make sure you get that uh, either in the chat or through a specific way that you can uh, link to that for future reference. Uh, next slide. Also, CDC has now posted clinical guidance, and you can see here this is clinical considerations for use of the Pfizer vaccine. Many of you are probably aware of that. Um, and there's some specific information about um, uh, contraindications or reasons to have uh, precautions with this vaccine. I'm not going to go into this. Dr. Bridges is going to be covering this later, um, but I just want to make you aware of the site where you can always uh, refer for uh, this information. And I think that's my last slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, so these are just some links um, that we've referred to today. We'll make sure you have a, uh, these handy um, for your reference. And I'd like to ask that we hold questions. I know we're already behind. And any questions you have for me, unless they're just clarif quick clarifying questions, um, let's hold until after Dr. Bridges' presentation. We can answer all the, I think she's going to address a lot of questions that might be asked at this point. So let's hold till after her presentation. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Hahn. Uh, next, and that was quick. Thank you for that. Next, we're going to move to our clarification of subgroup prioritizations, including some votes from our voting members uh, with Elke and Dr. Burgess. Great. Thank you, Monica. So I am going to, we're going to be throwing a lot of information at you, and we're going to ask you to really, those who are voting members, to be 
really paying attention and um, really be ready to respond to your voting button um, because we're, we have a series of uh, quite a few votes that we need to get through. If you'll advance the next slide, please. So the, this slide and the next two slides hopefully look familiar to you. They are the, um, the slides or the, the information that's been put up onto the coronavirus.idaho.gov site. These are your um, priority rankings that you voted on previously. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see that this is how we ranked the healthcare personnel and long-term care facility residents. That's the, the, that shouldn't be any surprise. And then the next one is for uh, essential workers. So that's all in a nice PDF format and uploaded onto the site. And I'm going to be using uh, that uh, healthcare personnel and long-term care facility residents slide over the next a whole series of slides coming up. And what I'm going to be doing is talking to you about the input that we've received on healthcare personnel and long-term care facility residents and um, how this information has come in to us and, and the process that we've taken, and then we're going to be asking you for a vote. So I'll present some information, I'll ask you, for, and then Patrice will be asking you for a vote. So if you'll go to the next slide, please. Or, yeah, thank you. So just a, a bit of a background. So as I talked about earlier in this presentation, um, we, we are getting public comment through our that public email that I showed you earlier in the in the meeting. <clears throat> we also, of course, have gotten a lot of information coming to us through phone calls, through emails, things that are forwarded. Some of you, um, I'm sure, are getting uh, um, pinged as well with people who have an interest in either um, making clarifications to where where their group or their advocacy group that they. Um, represent where they fit in to that ranking um, or we've even seen some requests to have rankings a, a, a certain group changed in the ranking <clears throat> and because of the the volume that's come in today we really have time just to look at that first level also known as the ASIP 1A group it's easier to say <laughs> the healthcare worker group um, so what we've done is we have taken this input, and we've even taken input on subsequent groups too, as well as the essential workers and beyond, and, and I'll show you that towards the end. But um, health and welfare staff have taken that input. We've done some triage with that information, with all this new input. So we've looked at it in comparison to standards-based uh, uh, specific category clarifications to categories. Uh, so we've added that that you'll see in there. We've also looked at um, the implication of changing any of those rankings. And so we're going to be presenting to the, those to you in that series of vote, a series of information. And then we'll be asking you to vote on some of this clarification. So next slide, please. Patrice. So this is Patrice. So um, I think uh, LK explained it pretty well, but just uh, um, another review that since we have 15 yes no votes um, we'd just like to have you limit your questions to anything that you know either doesn't make sense or, or you have concerns about um, most of these um, I personally don't think will be very controversial I think they're really uh, again clarifying what we've already voted on but we really want to be respectful and respond to all the input we've received that's been part of our uh, goals of our committee is is that transparency so that's really the point of of revisiting what we've already done and in the to just respond to the input and, and do some clarifying so I think it'll become clear as we go through uh, the next few uh, votes and slides thanks Patrice and I do want to point out remember that little megaphone button that Monica reviewed off to the side right below the, the at the bottom of your participant list is the, the mechanism that we'll use and so we'll kind of ask you to kind of quickly take action so we can make our way through each one of these so the way we'll do this is, like I said, is if Natalie will, um, whoever will move to the next slide, I will be reviewing the input that we received, the category in which it's applied to, and then the next slide will be the call for the vote. So this first one um, for health, so the foundation of every slide, just to orient you, is going to be that group 1A, the healthcare personnel and long-term care facility. You can see in the yellow highlight, I'm highlighting what the comment pertains to and then it asks for this clarification. So in this case here, there have been some questions about whether or not family members of healthcare personnel 
um, and others in ASEP phase 1A and in this case 1B if they should be receiving the vaccine at the same time as health, the healthcare workers. So our clarification is that based on the goals and principles that we've already identified for CVAC, family members of healthcare personnel should not be included in the initial phase of vaccine. Family members should be vaccinated when the group in which they belong is scheduled. So for example, if you have um, a family member who is an, an at-risk population or otherwise generally healthy, um, that they would then fall into subsequent um, vaccine groups as we move through our priority scales. So um, the next slide, please, and we'll turn it over to Patrice. So this was our first vote. So we get to use our little megaphone. If you agree uh, with the statement here that family members should not be included in just because they're a family member, but only in whichever group they would naturally belong, then click yes. If you do not agree, then click no. And are, are there any hands up or anything in the chat that we need to respond to for my people that are monitoring that? Dr. Burgess, this is Angela. Just a reminder, this is for voting members only. Thank you. Dr. Burgess, there's no, there's nothing in the chat rel rel related to this. Thank you. I meant to ask that before I asked for the vote, but thank you. I'll do better next time. I don't see so any. I'll, re I'll, I'll rely on Monica to uh, summarize the vote when that's available, and then we'll go to the next one. All right. So if everyone could rapidly vote, we'll take a look and see where we're at. We're at 28 uh, votes so far. So I think we're very close. Um, I'm going to give it a couple more seconds. I don't see anything moving or changing. All right, I'm going to go ahead and announce it, understanding there might be some more. We have 29 yeses, zero noes. Great. Thank you. Fantastic. So now you have a flavor of the 15 votes that we're going to ask you to do. <laughs> so get ready. Here we go for the next one, the next bit of feedback that came in. So this next round that we have here is based upon our subgroup 1.1, which is the hospital staff essential for care of COVID-19 patients and maintaining hospital capacity. Um, we'd already denoted that it includes support staff as well as clinical staff. These, this input that's come in were to clarify, these, so this will constitute two votes here, um, that medical imaging professionals be included in this group, and another comment about regulated medical waste workers who enter the hospital medical facilities, including patient rooms, also be included. So remember, there are there there is with all these some room to, for interpretation as in, for the people who are doing these vaccinations. Um, but these are input that's come into us, and we're asking you to to help assist with some of the clarification. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to do these two votes separately. Uh, the first of all, we'll be talking about uh, clarifying that medical imaging professionals do belong in that category, uh, 1.1. 1. 1. Uh, are there any raised hands or comments in the chat that we need to address before we vote? No raised hands, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you so much. So please go back to your little megaphone and vote uh, yes if you agree with medical imaging professionals being part of this group. Again, clarifying that they're part of this group and no if you do not agree. I'm keeping tabs, we're at 25. All right, we're staying stable at 28 votes right now, and I'll go ahead and announce it. We have 28 yeses, zero noes. Okay, I, I see a hand raised uh, from Dr. Peterman and Dr. Wyatt. So I don't know if they wanna talk about the next group or... Um... Sorry, that came in late. Dr. Okay. So mine is just a quick question on the, this is Dr. Wyatt on the medical waste. This says who enter hospital and medical facilities. Um, this is focusing on inpatient stuff at this point, but this is a broader category. So we would be including these outpatient workers where we're not doing that for other healthcare workers. I just need some clarification on the role of these people a little bit more. And 
this is okay. So you are you're talking about the next group. So. Um, um, and then Dr. Peterman messaged me that he did not mean to raise his hand. So, Monica, did we finish the medical imaging vote? Yes, it looks like that? Just one vote, but we're at 27 yeses, zero noes. Okay, so we had we had 31 for the first time, right? We had 29. Let me check my notes. Okay, I'm just 29 I'm zero lost. for the first one. Okay, so we, we either had two. Two abstentions or two people that we, we lost somehow, but in, in any case, I think that's a sufficient group. Okay, so now Dr. Wyatt's question is about this next group, the uh, regulated medical waste workers. And I think it sounded like what you were concerned, uh, Dr. Wyatt, about hospital and medical facilities, including patient rooms, and what medical facilities means. Is that your, the nature of your question? Right. I give my, the nature of my question is just that typically working under the 1.1a, these are mostly inpatient medical staff working in our hospitals, caring for hospitalized patients to maintain hospital capacity. And if we're talking this broadly to medical waste workers who go to outpatient clinics to empty the biohazard stuff, that puts them in a higher tier than what the, our other outpatient medical workers are getting access to. So I guess I just need some more clarification on that before I could vote. Okay, and this is <clears throat> where um, I'm, I know I'm hopefully Dr. Chris Carter, who has been helping us with some of this um, work, can speak to some of the, she was seeing all of the raw information that was coming in and helping us do some of this categorization. If maybe Dr. Carter, you can speak to that piece of it. Dr. Carter, are you on with us? I think I am now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I am not sure that the regulated waste medical waste workers um, can be separated into those that just work with hospitals and those that just work with the medical facilities. I understand the question, but I can't say if a particular employee only does a hospital and never goes to a um, medical facility, or if there's crossover. I think it's it's likely they could be doing both, the same employee. Thank you, Chris. So I would I would look at this as because we're going to maybe bump into this along the way with all of these categories that. There is going, as I mentioned, there is going to be some level of discretion needed for those who are conducting the vaccinations at these clinics, um, the vaccine clinics, not the clinics clinics, but um, just helping to understand the intent and to clarify some of that a little bit. I don't know that we're ever going to reach perfection and total clarity on all of this, but um, kind of looking for votes that maybe our can you live with this <laughs> dr why does that help yeah it's just it is a very much a struggle because i have an outpatient clinic where we are actively caring for covid positive patients and my employees who have direct interaction with these every day can't access the vaccine uh, in weeks one, two, three, we're pu pushed on to, you know, later on. And so now everybody is going to be lobbying to get their groups in on this where, you know, my employees don't have that same luxury. So um, it's, I'm just saying that it, I think we have to be very cautious with every lobbying group coming forward, wanting their people at the front of the line. This is Dr. Sandy. If I could just point out, I, I really think when we look at this, you need to look at the um, duration of exposure to uh, COVID positive patients, as well as uh, the intensity of that exposure. You know, an ICU nurse doing a 12 hour shift obviously is gonna have a high, high level of exposure versus medical waste who's in and out of a room just only with a couple of minutes of exposure. With that waste being fully bagged. 
We have one more hands up with uh, Nate Thompson. Um, thank you. I moved this to the chat as well, but this is kind of a question for Dr. Wyatt, but others as well who have expertise in this area. It's really just a question as to, do we know kind of epidemiologically what the risk level for the medical waste workers is? Because uh, kind of what I've been led to understand and working with this population is the transmission risk is, is droplet first and foremost, followed by airborne, uh, with some exceptions, certainly like aerosol generating procedures. And then contact is a risk point, certainly, but not, not the highest tier of risk in terms of exposure or transmission. Um, so just kind of factoring that into the vote, uh, can, can Dr. White or others with, you know, uh, expertise in that area comment? I can quickly take that. So Nate, you make a good point that, um, we keep medical waste is highly regulated and it's, these are going to be already well bagged, processed. Um, they're not having direct interaction with patients in, in this regard. Um, they are already wearing protective clothing when they process this and the risk of transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in that setting with what they're doing is going to be very low. Um, so much less than our healthcare workers who have direct face-to-face -face contact with patients who are known COVID positives or potentially asymptomatic and, and COVID positive. So this is Patrice. I think, um, you know, for the interest of time, we can we can vote on this um, and see how we're doing. If we're having difficulty, we can certainly move this one group uh, to a future meeting, but we have several others to discuss, um, but it's great discussion. Um, I wish we had, more time, um, but I, I would like to go ahead and see if we can vote on this, see how we're how we're feeling as a group, and then decide if it needs further discussion at, at a future meeting. Um, so let's go ahead. If you agree with um, the clarification of adding um, clarifying re regulated medical waste workers belong in this group, then vote yes with your little megaphone, and if you do not, then vote no. And I had a question on where to find the megaphone from one of our members uh, and it it's is right above your uh, chat uh, at least for me I have participants and then I have chat and there's a little line between the two and my megaphone is right above that little line right next to where you raise your hand Okay, so we have 27 votes so far and the pattern is looking pretty clear. We have, well, we have five yeses now and we have 23 noes. Okay, well, that seems like a fairly large group of noes. So we will um, not clarify this group within the 1.1 group. All right, let's move on to the next decision point. Great, thank you. And, and as mentioned, we can always bring these back to the group. Uh, the next one you see here is related to long-term care facility staff. So this was clarification on two items. The first is that it would also apply to group adult daycare staff. They're not, um, not addressed currently. Um, they are adults that are in congregate settings and needing care uh, and they might come from multiple households to one location. So this is clarification to in include group adult daycare staff. The second is intermediate care facility for individuals with intellectual disabilities staff. So these are staff that have not also, that also have not been specifically addressed um, in that ASIP other residential care category. And the clarification is to include them also uh, as it pertains to long-term care facility staff. And remember, long-term care facility applies to skilled nursing facility, assisted living, independent living. So it's kind of the, the broader, I think Sarah pointed that out in her one of her slides. So this is just further clarification and the next page will take your vote. We have a hands up, uh, Richard Augustus. So these are not where they live. This is just their day setting similar to what a child going to school would get. That is correct. Unless Dr. Okay. Carter has anything additional that she needs to add. No, that is correct. These are adults who are living and receiving care at home. And during the day, they go to an adult daycare. 
where they may be getting um, health care, some health care as well, and then they will go home at night back to their home residences. So in the daytime, they are in a congregate setting and they are going back and forth to multiple households. The hands up, Mel Leviton. This is Mel. I just want to point out that there are not a whole lot of these open right now across the state, but the ones that are open are serving a critical need for respite care for family members who have no direct care workforce working with the people, um, family members that they're taking care of. And I just want to point that out. Thanks, Mel. Thank you. Any other hands up or chat comments that we need to address? I don't see any hands. Okay, so back to your little megaphone. If you agree with clarifying that this group belongs in uh, this category, go ahead and click yes. If you do not agree, click no. I'm watching the numbers. <laughs> Okay, I think we're very close at this point. We have 20, 20 yeses. Sometimes they, the numbers change a little bit. So what you'll see in the meeting notes might be slightly different as votes come in, maybe a couple seconds after discussion. But right now we have 20 yeses and 10 noes. Okay, so we're having more, um, I wouldn't call that a split vote. It's still clearly a majority. Um, but we can, we're going to work our way through this and go with the majority. And if we need to revisit at some point and have time, we will. But I think in the interest of time, let's continue with our majority uh, rules. So that one did pass. And then the next one, um, as Elke commented on, the intermediate care facility for individuals with intellectual disability staff. Um, if you want to agree with including them, uh, go ahead and click. Oh, uh, first of all, do we have any hands raised or comments regarding this group? I don't see any hands. All right, so if you agree with including this group uh, as a clarification, go ahead and click yes. If not, click no. Okay, I think we're just about there. Oh, uh, we have uh, 20 yeses and eight noes. 21 yeses now, eight noes. That passes as well, so we'll go on to the next uh, decision groups. Great. The next one, as you see, drops down to the next line on the healthcare personnel. This is addressing home care providers for adults age 65 years of age and older. Um, and sorry, it cuts off the whole rest of the line. Uh, or for other adults or children with high risk medical conditions. So these are home care providers providing that care. So in this case, there's clarification to include the staff of certified family homes um, that are caring for individuals. Um, and then the second one is for drivers who transport adults age 65 years of age and older or other adults or children with high risk medical conditions to those medical appointments. Uh, and this clarification will be to include those drivers as part of home care providers. Next slide. Okay, so I, 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 I hope you guys can see that we're just within these categories clarifying. We're not moving these people up to a different category. We're just clarifying them within each category. So uh, any hands up or chat regarding uh, number six, the staff of certified family homes. I see a hand up, Richard Augustus. So again, we're prioritizing these folks above the people next on the list, which are emergency medical staff. Just to be clear. Yes. 
Well, what we're doing is we're saying in this home care provider category, or we're clarifying, do these people belong in that category or not? So we're not necessarily taking them out of a different cat. We're just saying, are, are they considered part of this group, if that makes sense? For instance, Patrice, the next category is emergency medical service staff. Mm -hmm. So our paramedics mm -hmm. are being below drivers who transport 65-year-old people to routine appointments. We have a hands up with Mel Levington. Levington. Yeah, this is Mel. So I just want to address the staff of certified family homes, not not the drivers, because uh, I agree that's a different issue. Um, but the staff of certified family homes, that's again, home and community based services, which qualifies as home care providers. Um, and so I just I want to I want to clarify that that's a fairly important group that serves a high risk population. Um, the reason they're at home is because it's more efficient um, and cost effective for them to receive care at home instead of a facility, but they are at hospital level of care or facility level of care. Thank you. All right, thank you. So let's look, uh, if we don't have any more comments in the chat or hands raised, let's vote on number six family homes if you agree that they belong in this home care provider for adults 65 and over category go ahead and click yes and if you do not agree click no we're getting close Okay, I think we can call it at this point. It might vary just a little bit, but we have 26 yeses and four no's. Okay, thank you guys very much. Uh, so you heard the comment from Dr. Augustus on number seven. I don't know if we have any other, I know we're running over time, um, which is not surprising. This is a lot of, <laughs> a lot of things to vote on. Um, any other comments or raised hands on the number seven category, drivers who transport adults 65 and older um, or other adults with high risk conditions to medical appointments. I don't see any hands. Okay, so this, this is if you agree. Oh, sorry, this I'm is sorry, Dr. Humso. I had raised my hand and put in a comment in the chat. So a non-voting member, like I agree that it's con potentially concerning that the drivers were pre-prioritized over EMS, but I think we have to think about the fact that they don't have PPE or in a small enclosed space potentially for an extended period of time taking high risk patients to crucial appointments like dialysis, et cetera. So I do think, I don't know, I would encourage you guys to think about them, you know, somewhere up there in terms of priority. I'm not sure exactly where. That's just a comment for me, non-voting member, but Medicaid that obviously works with NEMT. Thank you. Okay, Mel, so. Sorry, we have a I'm hand sorry. from Mel, Mel Leviton. Yeah, I'll be quiet. So again, this is for, I, I want to clarify, you're talking about non-emergency medical um, transportation, like Dr. Hemso said, correct? That's primarily who we're talking about? Medicaid paid for transport? Um, I'm going to defer to uh, whoever knows. Oh, yeah. yeah at least so some of these comments came in separate. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so with number seven, this is really talking about those home health care providers. They're part of agencies who provide this essential support for homebound adults who are high risk medical conditions and taking them um, to their medical appointments or transferring them. That That's the intent behind number seven. Okay. Okay, and this is Mel still. So just to clarify, it's not the non-emergency medical transportation that's providing transportation for a 10-year-old to go get his all physical, correct? Number seven is not an EMT agency who is doing a transport. 
No, I understand that. But if it's not yep. emergency medical transportation through Medicaid, they provide transportation for an array of people to go to their medical appointments. And I just want to clarify that this isn't all NEMT providers. It's only those who provide rides because there's no way to make a distinction. The driver pulls off a ticket like an Uber driver. Right. Yeah, this is Dr. Holmes. So like, I, I would agree with that, that they transport potentially anyone and, and it's someone who has a home caregiver, you know, or, or a home attendant or something, they might join them in the NEMT ride to that appointment, right? But might not put them in their own vehicle, right? If they have that transport benefit. But, but obviously these drivers would take high risk patients and not high risk patients. But always without PP, and obviously if somebody is in a car with a COVID positive patients, they are not available to transport patients and in quarantine and potentially could get sick. So again, I, I you know, obviously non-voting member don't know exactly where they should fit, um, but I think they do have significant high risk. Okay, so this is Patrice. We have, I think, eight more to do, and we're we're over time. So I would like to take a vote. And again, if we're neck and neck, and there's not a clear majority, we can table table this discussion for our next meeting, just so we can at least get as many clarified as we are comfortable clarifying. So, if you agree that this group belongs in the home care provider group, please click yes. If you do not agree, please click no. And Monica, I'm I'm sure you're clearing between votes, right? Or do people have they don't have to self clear? Yes, no. Natalie's in charge of that. Yes. Right. Okay. Fair enough. I just make making sure. <laughs> yes, no, that's important. Thank you for checking. All right, we are at twenty two no's, nine yeses. All right. So based on our majority rule, we will uh, not include that group and move on to our next. So just checking in, Dr. Burgess, we, we want to continue on with the votes right now, uh, given time. I know these are important. Well, um, I, I, I think we have to decide our priority between our presentations and our vote. I do think these presentations are valuable. Um, we can send the slide deck out and finish our voting next meeting. Uh, Elke, would that, would that be what you would recommend also, or what do you think? We can certainly do that um, since we are further down the list of uh, folks who would be getting vaccinated um, and kind of based on the way the, uh, the vaccine is coming into the state, it's going to be a couple of weeks before we get into these groups and we've kind of made it through the top level priority, so we can certainly do that. All right, let's do that since, um, since we know um, you know, just like she said, we know we have a little bit of time and I think there's going to be a lot of interest in these next two presentations. So you guys now know kind of the flavor of what we're doing and um, we will um, um, pick up where we left off uh, at our next meeting and, and hopefully get, get the rest of these done and then we'll have some similar votes on the essential health, uh, excuse me, essential workers uh, based on feedback and comments that we're getting between the meetings. So. I think now we at least all understand uh, what uh, what we have b before us, and I will turn it back over either to Monica or Amy uh, for the presentation. And Patrice, before we do that, perhaps I can at least give a flavor to the group um, if Natalie could advance to the slide number 22. Um, because this this gives you this is when we start even getting into the next level of input. So this is on essential workers, and you're seeing that in some of the categories under essential workers, we're getting quite a bit of feedback. So I just and and even beyond, if you go to the next slide really quickly, just as a visual, I mean this is even beyond the essential workers phase. We're starting to get feedback. So. Just as a, a point of reference to you all, that there is a significant amount of work um, and uh, that and considerations that still need to come into play. So um, we can think maybe about how we reformat the meetings in the future, or also keep in mind you know, we have meetings every couple of weeks, but maybe this is we have to figure out a way to do this in between um, or have more frequent meetings to get through this. 
So just as a point of reference, but I wanted to at least give you that, that framing. Excellent. Thank you, Elke. This is easy, isn't it? Easy work. Not really. Um, so we will figure out the process moving forward for that. And right now, I'd like to invite Amy Gamet to speak to us about public health district vaccine plans. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, good afternoon. Happy Friday, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to be providing an overview of the seven public health districts COVID-19 vaccine mm -hmm. distribution plans um, for this week. Um, following the presentation today, all the health district um, directors are on and they'll be available for additional questions at that time. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is just a map that shows the seven um, health districts. There are seven independent public health districts throughout the state. Um, since they were established in 1970, they've been focused on ensuring that public health services are made available to protect um, all the counties in Idaho. Um, and again, they touch on, they include all 44 counties. Next slide, please. And so I'm sure everybody's aware that limited doses are were not available for, sorry, <laughs> extremely limited doses were available um, week one of the COVID-19 vaccine. State could break those doses up. Um, they based that percentage on the total inpatient healthcare workers and long-term care facility staff throughout the health district. Um, so the total doses, and I think Sarah also spoke to this earlier, this week was 13,650. Um, all those, I believe, have been received, um, some as soon as Monday, and then I think they finished up with that yesterday. Um, next slide. All of the health districts um, and hospitals are very familiar with um, storage and handling. It's, it's been a requirement of immunizations, and we're very familiar with that. Um, the Pfizer vaccine did... <coughs> The Pfizer vaccine did present some challenges with the ultra storage requirement of the vaccine, but hospitals, health departments were able to work through plans to meet those challenges. Um, they were either able to uh, procure an ultra cold freezer, um, work with a partner facility that had the right equipment, or develop a plan that allowed them to replenish with dry ice before distribution. Um, next slide. Um, this just shows the breakdown among the districts. Um, each of the health districts followed CVAC's priority of healthcare personnel and long-term care facility residents in their distribution plans. Um, these are the plans for District 1 um, and District 2. And I'll just leave that up for a minute so everybody can look at that. Okay, next slide. Uh, again, these were week one distribution plans for uh, three, four, and five. Okay, next slide. Um, and then district six and seven. In, in all the plans, you're gonna notice statewide that hospitals relieved a large proportion of the first week's vaccinations. Um, and those doses were administered to healthcare workers that directly work with COVID positive individuals. Uh, next slide. I just wanted to put things into perspective and remind everybody that we're, we're five days into a vaccination rollout um, for a pandemic that started nine months ago. Um, and for some, some facilities, not even five days, again, they received their vaccine yesterday, so they're one day um, in their vaccination planning. And there were a lot of limitations with the Pfizer doses, um, the, the, the requirement of 975 dose minimum to be shipped to a facility. And then again, to break those down, there's a five-day window with redistribution sites once they, once they receive those vaccine. Um, and then just the fluid environment, right? Um, and that seems to be everything COVID. Um, doses changed, as Sarah also talked about. And then even CVAX, um, our priority is as they changed, um, impacted those planning. Next slide. <clears throat> So, so where do we go from here, um, vaccine planning? You know, as we move into week two um, and beyond, you know, we're trying to plan for additional doses um, and then additional priorities for vaccination. 
Again, we're referring to that organization program for partners to provide as enrollees. Um, some challenges have been that we're, we're not sure who is seeking that out. Um, we're currently enrolled. And then just planning on preparing for vaccination clinics again as those priority groups um, expand. And e even us trying to seek clarification as a CVAC committee, um, you know, I, I, we, there's a lot of concern when we move into some of those bigger categories, essential workers. I, I heard the a comment the other day um, when, when it gets to the free for all stage. Um, and so there's some you know, concerns on how, how, to, how to take care of that as well. And, and then I just want to end with, before I, I turn it over to the directors, it, it's been an extremely long nine months. Um, it's very rare that, that I ever have beat my director to work, and I, I don't know that I've ever left before she's left. You know, it's been long weekends, um, long nights. I, I know hospital staff um, are exhausted um, as well, and so I just want everybody to reflect that this was a historic week. You know, we, we had vaccine this week for a pandemic again that's been going on for for nine months, and so I think it's hard for us to remember that. Uh, and then I wanted I wanted to read just one one sentence from a, a hospital CEO CEO just expressing thanks for their again their very limited doses to their hospital staff. I'm not even touching the the, the amount that they needed, but he said. I, I wish you could have seen and felt the sense of gratitude of our people receiving the vaccine over the past couple of days. Um, and, and again, that just puts that into perspective and we want to make sure that we follow those those groups and assure that we can get vaccine um, to the people that that need it, need it the most. Um, and I appreciate everybody on CVAC helping the health departments and other hospitals and partners trying to to get through that challenge and um, move us forward in the right direction. That's the end of my presentation. I'll turn it over to the, the directors. Or questions for the directors, I should say. Thank you, Amy. Do we have any directors uh, present who would like to add to Amy's presentation? Well, this is Patrice. I, I'm not a director, but I just uh, I want to echo what what was just said about the uh, um, the positive vibe uh, that that this uh, boost this has given uh, people that have been through a, a rough stretch. Um, and it's been really neat to see this week. Uh, people have finally seen a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. Absolutely, we have a hands up, uh, Dr. Hudspeth. Dr. Hudspeth, could you unmute? Sorry about that. I have a question about coming up in the next months. What is the plan for the when we get down to the general public rollout? Have you, has the public health department started talking about that yet? So, Randy, this is Patrice. We are going to probably hold on that as. Um, there's a lot of communication that's going to be coming as we get to those next groups. Um, okay. So unless somebody has a quicker answer, um, I think we might want to wait because that's a big topic. I just wondered about the timeline of when the t when that conversation would start. Can anyone weigh in, the, weigh in on that? Yeah, well, this is Dr. Hahn. I'll, I'll just answer for Division of Public Health folks on the call. And I would say, um, really, as you heard from um, Sarah already, we are getting changes. Day. I feel like we're trying to move forward and we're getting booby traps and, and new ladders to climb and all that. And we are just trying to make this first part successful. That's where most of our focus is getting it to healthcare, frontline healthcare workers, getting it out, getting that long-term care program started and, and going well, getting other long-term care facilities vaccinated that are not in the federal program. That said, you're absolutely right. We do need to think, we need to pull our eyes up higher and think longer in the future. Um, I think the hope is that by the time we get to the general public, there'll be ample vaccine and it'll simply be a matter of us distributing and educating um, to people. But maybe at our next um, meeting, because I understand that, you know, we need to talk about it. Maybe we could have a a segment devoted to just talking about those more long long term picture. Thank you. I've made a note of that for future meetings. 
Excellent. We have a couple other hands up here. Uh, Christine Newhoff. Thank you. I think my question is uh, somewhat similar to what uh, was just asked, but a little bit different. And that is, you know, for these first couple of categories of hospital uh, and clinic workers and long term care facilities and staff, those are, are relatively, I'll just say relatively easy groups for us to identify and get scheduled and vaccinated. But as we get to other groupings, is there a, a plan for how people in these other priority groups will know which group they're in and will know when it's time for them to start scheduling their vaccinations and with whom they would be able to schedule them? Uh, because I, I think we have a little bit of time because it'll take us a while to get through those first few subgroups, but, uh, but it seems to me people are very anxious. I know we're getting calls, I'm sure probably most folks, if not everyone on this, um, meeting is getting calls about um, when people can start scheduling their appointments for whatever tier or group they happen to be in. So is there a, is there a, a plan already developed? Is that something that, uh, that this committee will be reviewing and, and assisting with? Um, I think I just wanted to at least, I don't know about the, um, if I can answer how people will know, I need to think about that one, um, but definitely in the planning is just identifying the partners um, that are available to help fill those gaps um, in each of the health districts. And, and Christy, this is LK and I'll add to that, you know, we work with our public health partners practically every day throughout the week and um, trying to think about how how we're going to be able to roll this out effectively and make sure that we have adequate um, you know, conversations, planning, resources, and all of that. Um, I think, as Chris alluded to, or Dr. Hahn alluded to, you know, we've got like this fire hose of information and change coming at us constantly. Uh, so I, I, I can foresee a future where we have, you know, a lot of information being sent out to the public. And so there's, you know, um, you know, what am I trying to say? Like, whether that's a, you know, go to the website, here's where you can find the latest information on, on what vaccine group is up next, or, uh, you know, through the public information officers of the local health districts, working with our staff to get information out. I think there's a lot of, a lot of good novel ways that we can look at, at how to get that information out. Um, but we are, you know, working in lockstep with the districts to make sure that they're supported to be able to set up um, the relationships with clinics and their communities, uh, uh, any vaccine clinics that they'll be doing themselves. So I think you're, you're right. We need to continue to bring that information back to this group and get more of that information out to the public as well. So it sounds like Monica has this as a topic for our next meeting to review, right? Monica? I have flagged that. Yes, I have. We have a couple more hands up and we have a couple minutes. So I'd like to invite Karen Sharpnack to unmute. Hi. Thank, Thank you. you. I just want to say that this, the health districts have been doing extraordinary work, the directors as well as the staff and the volunteers. And just want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. You've been beat up, um, you've been challenged, and you're working long hours. So thank you for your time and all of the work that you're doing for your communities. Thank you, Karen. And we have uh, Dr. McCluskey, hands up. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'd echo those comments. I'm gonna put my Board of Medicine hat on for a second and advocate for my independent colleagues that are outpatient um, physicians. I'm getting a lot of questions from them around how they may know when it's time that they can then um, move forward. And uh, they're getting mixed messages, I think, from many of the public health districts as to where they can obtain the vaccination. So I'm one, I want to be able to provide them with the right information. So I'm wondering if you have any guidance for us as we uh, try to help these folks um, get to the vaccination once they're their you know their prioritization level hits and when you're talking about outpatient independent practitioners that that's going to be soon um, um, once we get all the hospital folks taken care of thanks we'd like to take that one 
Um, this is Amy again, and any of the directors, please chime in. Um, I think some of the difficulty there is uh, it could vary a little bit from district to district, um, it is, and that is a challenge as well. And so some of those districts that are close geographically, um, that definitely can create some confusion. I think we're doing our best trying to stay within those same categories, but there's, uh, you know, just there's a little bit of fluctuation within them themselves. If I can just clarify, so if I was to tell them that they notify or that they try to schedule that with one of the providers that the that we know are providing the vaccination, would that be enough? I mean, would would that be the essentially what you all would be advising them anyway? And then it, it sort of flushes out as to when they show up at that site, whether they meet criteria or not, um, much like it is with our hospital groups right now. Who can clarify that? This is Nikki Zog, director at Southwest District Health. I can speak for my six county health district. Can you go ahead? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Just making sure I'm being heard. Um, yeah. yeah, so for, for our district, um, at least right now, like the first shipment, we just rolled out our first shipment today and we did include some outpatient clinics um, in addition to the hospitals, uh, five hospitals in our district. So um, I think for our district, the best way to um, reach, uh, to connect with the, the independent provider offices is for them to reach out to us if they haven't heard from us already. Um, but that is again, just for our district and I recognize the other districts may be doing things differently. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Any other uh, comments on that, or answers to that? Um, and this is Amy again. I know in our health district, on our webpage, we've created an email where um, providers can actually email us that information. Excellent. And we're also actively trying to reach out to them as well with the information that we have on the providers in our area. Excellent, thank you. I see a hands up, Yvonne Ketchum Ward. Um, you know, anything that we can do, and I know it's fluid, so I don't want to beat a dead horse, to let the public know when it's going to be their turn and how long. I've even had questions from members of our legislature and people that are constitutionally going to have to go to the state house in January. There's going to be a lot of people not wearing masks there. Um, they they have to show up, right? So um, just we need to let people know when their place in line is going to be. I think they understand that they're going to fall into the category based on their age and comorbidities, but just it's at all levels that people want to know. So as soon as we can get some sort of information out about when it's going to be their turn, it would be very helpful. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, I'm just checking time here. It's um, about time for us to uh, transition to our next presentation. I don't see any more hands at the moment. And um, I just want to thank Amy for her presentation. There was a lot of fantastic information in there. Uh, like before, we're gonna be sending out the slides so that you'll be able to use those slides as reference to really get into some details if you'd like to cover more of those details that Amy shared with us today. So thank you so much, Amy and uh, for the work that is being done at the public health districts. Next, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Bridges to talk to us about vaccine safety and effectiveness. Thank you so much. Um, next slide, please. So um, we have now, hopefully, we will have the Moderna uh, officially have the EUA emergency use authorization. Um, coming soon, FDA has indicated um, that they will be issuing an emergency use authorization. And then the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices and CDC will be meeting over the weekend. Um, so uh, in anticipation of having these two uh, messenger RNA vaccines, this is just a comparison of the two. They differ uh, somewhat in the number of days between dose one and dose two. 21 days for Pfizer, 21 days for Moderna. 
Uh, we've already talked about the um, storage and handling challenges um, with the Pfizer vaccine. I won't go into that, but um, for those unfamiliar with Moderna, uh, it is available at refrigerator temperature for 30 days. Um, they have differences in the time that the vials can be at room temperature, uh, much shorter with Pfizer. Um, but for both vaccines, um, neither one has a preservative in it. The providers have been uh, cautioned to make sure that they are very vigilant about using a sterile technique. And you have essentially six hours after the vial is punctured um, before all of the doses in that vial need to be used uh, and um, before the vial needs to be um, thrown away. The um, ages uh, differ for which they're likely to have um, EUA approval. It is approved for 16, as young as 16 years for Pfizer. Um, 18 is um, the likely age for Moderna. Um, the Pfizer vaccine does need to be reconstituted with sterile saline. The Moderna vaccine does not. Um, the dosing size also varies between these two vaccines. It's 0.03 or 0 0.3 mils for Pfizer and 0 0.5 for Moderna. Uh, the doses per vial are five to six with Pfizer and 10 doses with Moderna, but their effectiveness is similar. But you can see that there are certainly potential for um, vaccine administration errors uh, with these two vaccines. And um, so uh, ensuring that providers are well-trained before they're administering these vaccines will be important. Next slide. So um, in the Pfizer study, uh, they had um, about 44,000 people the solicited adverse reactions, so those are the ones where they ask participants to report um, uh, daily for a week what uh, kinds of symptoms they had. Uh, they reported injection site reactions, um, fatigue, headache, muscle pain, chills, joint pain, and fever most often. Severe adverse reactions were limited in dose one. Uh, for dose two, um, the reactions uh, were more frequent at 4.6% for severe reactions. They were also more frequent among persons less than 55 years of age. Adverse uh, reactions that were rated as severe were low in both the vaccine and placebo, and they did not um, differ among the vaccine and placebo groups. And for the uh, placebo group, the, the placebo group received normal saline or, or salt water. In terms of unsolicited adverse events that were reported, there were 64 cases of lymphadenopathy in the vaccine group and six in the placebo group. So that swelling and tenderness in the um, axillary area, the underarm. There were um, four cases of Bell's palsy among vaccine recipients. So those occurred at a range of three to 48 days after vaccination. And there were no cases in the placebo group. Both the FDA um, and the manufacturers stated in their um, FDA briefings that the number of cases of Bell's palsy with, was within what is expected uh, for that number of people over that time range. So it was not more than anticipated, um, but I'm sure they will be following this. Uh, and it is just you know another reminder that um, we hope that everybody will uh, make sure and be reporting uh, adverse events that, that do occur. Next slide. So one of the um, uh, tricky parts for providers, of course, and uh, long-term care facilities will be um, uh, the fever issue uh, uh, with people questioning whether that fever might be due to an infection versus a post-vaccination uh, event. Um, around 4% uh, of people after dose one who were younger than 55 had a um, fever and 16% after dose two. Uh, the fever reported was lower among persons um, over 55 years of age, 1% after dose one and 11% after dose two. And so uh, CDC has issued considerations for um, uh, how you might think about potential post-vaccination symptoms, particularly for healthcare personnel and residents of long-term care facilities, and that is on the CDC webpage. Next slide. So this is a slide from the vaccine manufacturer during their um, presentation to the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. 
And um, in this case, day one is the day that vaccine was administered. And you can see that most um, of the systemic events, so that fever, uh, fatigue, et cetera, were most prominent on the day after vaccination. And then those symptoms um, quickly uh, subsided for the vast majority of people um, by day three and four. Next slide. In terms of other um, reactions, there have been two cases uh, in the UK where anaphylaxis was reported. Um, there were two in the news from Alaska, only one of which was reported as being anaphylaxis. And I will say these have been reported in the media. Um, but cases are uh, under investigation, and I'm sure that we will hear um, more about those and potentially um, additional cases that may be reported. But for now, the contraindications to the Pfizer vaccine uh, is only a history of a severe reaction to a component of the vaccine. And um, right now, the components of the vaccine are only the messenger RNA and four uh, different lipids as well as um, electrolytes. Uh, precautions to the vaccine include um, severe allergic reaction to any injectable medication. If someone does have that um, type of a prior reaction, they should be observed for 30 minutes after vaccination. Um, other people need to be observed for 15 minutes um, after vaccination. Next slide. So uh, again, there is more information available on considerations for uh, management of potential post-vaccination uh, signs or symptoms on the CDC website. Right. Uh, so turning to safety monitoring and reporting, um, uh, just a reminder that there are um, certain requirements for COVID-19 vaccine um, providers that they need to report um, all serious adverse events, uh, any cases of multi-system inflammatory syndrome, both in children and adults, and um, cases of COVID-19, the result in hospitalization or death after someone has received the vaccine. Also, um, any clinically significant adverse event that occurs after vaccination should also be uh, reported and the um, requirements for reporting under the emergency use authorization may change as more information becomes available about safety. Uh, in addition, CDC has asked for all uh, COVID-19 vaccine providers to provide those who receive vaccines with information about vSafe. This is a smartphone-based tool to help monitor adverse events. And um, uh, we hope that people will agree to uh, this extra monitoring, which will provide um, extra rich information in real time about safety. Next slide. So um, just a little bit more information about the VSAFE. Um, uh, patients uh, sign up uh, themselves who receive vaccine. They get text messages uh, that they respond to. And if they're clinically important um, adverse events, then they will receive a phone call uh, from a CDC representative to identify additional information. Next slide. So now I'll turn to a Moderna vaccine. So as I mentioned, Moderna um, is seeking approval for vaccination of persons 18 years of age or older. It's also a two-dose vaccine, uh, 0 0.5 mils given one month apart. There are around 30,000 study participants and vaccine effectiveness uh, for Moderna was about 94%. Uh, percent in that similar to Pfizer, that vaccine effectiveness did not differ across age groups, uh, genders, racial and ethnic groups. Uh, or participants with medical comorbidities. Next slide. Uh, the solicited adverse reactions were very similar uh, to Pfizer. Uh, in terms of severe adverse reactions, those are reported um, uh, among 0.2% uh, for dose one, 9.7% for dose two, and were um, more frequent among adults less than 65 years of age. So again, similar pattern, uh, more reactogenicity after dose two and more often in younger people. And similar to the Pfizer study, pregnant women were excluded. Next slide, please. Um, this table just illustrates again that um, most of these uh, reactions were higher 
um, after dose two and the difference in reporting those symptoms, uh, the gap between placebo and vaccine uh, recipients was um, amplified in dose two compared to dose one. Next slide. So they also uh, reported some of their unsolicited adverse reactions. And uh, again, similar to Pfizer, they uh, reported um, lymphadenopathy or axillary swelling uh, and tenderness on the side where the vaccine was administered. That was reported in 21% of vaccine recipients less than 65 versus um, about 8% in placebo. And among patients um, who were older than 65, was 12% in vaccine uh, recipients and 6% in placebo. Um, they also reported some hypersensitivity events or allergic events. That was 1.5% in vaccine recipients, 1% in placebo. But in the clinical trial, they reported no uh, anaphylaxis or severe um, allergic reaction. Um, they did also uh, uh, report three cases, Bell's palsy in the vaccine group, and one in the placebo group. And again, these uh, reactions, um, I'm sorry, these uh, numbers of Bell's palsy cases were not different from what would be expected in the general population over that period of time. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. So there are a number of um, resources um, available um, to providers to find more information. On this page, um, you currently see a box, a green box there that says Pfizer BioNTech vaccine information. There'll be a similar box uh, from, uh, for Moderna once that um, EUA is complete and the ACIP recommendations um, have been approved. Next slide. That's the last slide. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. It's a lot of information that's emerging from these vaccines. Uh, we are right at time to start our wrap up for today, but I, I hate to cut it off without any chance for uh, questions. So if there's if there's a burning question, we might be able to take just one. And then please rest assured that we'll be taking a look at the chat. Uh, we have our question from hands up, Amy Gamut. Yeah, Dr. Bridges, so the excellent presentation. Um, so how do we um, get that information out to our healthcare workers when we're looking at groups like the long-term care facilities that hadn't partnered, where we've been pulling them, you know, how much of their staff are gonna be vaccinated and then what the uptake is. We have some skilled facilities with 0% of their staff being vaccinated up to around, I would say the high in the 60s and 70%. And so it's healthcare workers choosing not to be vaccinated due to their concern over adverse events. And, and I know education's been, and getting that public messaging out um, not has been difficult over the last nine months. So again, we're trying to vaccinate them to help protect that vulnerable population. And I, I think the uptake's gonna be low. Um, thank you so much for your question. The uh, Department of um, Health and Welfare has scheduled a number of um, provider trainings, and um, I'll, I'll um, hand it over to uh, Sarah to talk about how they're going to make those um, widely available. There are also calls uh, that the CDC manages. They're called COCA calls, um, uh, clinician outreach calls, and they post all of their information to the CDC website um, with, with those lectures. And there's also additional training is available um, on the CDC website as well. Um, I don't know if I have other clarification right now. Okay. Go ahead. Is that Sarah? Yeah, no, I don't have anything more to add beyond what Carolyn said. Great, thank you. And uh, I've tried to keep track of links and other information that we wanna to send to you after the meeting, including the meeting slides. So um, also rest assured that those are coming your way. And we do take a look at all the chat transcript as well after the meeting to try to pick up any anything that we may not have been able to get to. So thank you everyone for all of your great participation today, all your great, great input, questions, uh, weighing in on those votes today. 
uh, we covered a lot in a short amount of time. So I just want to appreciate everyone's participation in that. And of course, uh, thank you to all our pre uh, presenters, including Amy Gamet. I know you're extremely busy and thank you for taking the time to put together those great presentations and information for our committee to look at. Um, also want to uh, thank our staff before I forget and including uh, Kathy and Chris Hahn who monitored the chat for us uh, so that we can make sure we're looking at all of those questions as they come in and getting to just as many as we possibly can. With that, a quick meeting summary. Uh, we received our vaccine uh, program updates with Sarah. We heard from the latest at ASIP and their recommendations. Then we talked about the clarification of subgroups uh, with Elke and Dr. Burgess and took as many votes as we had time for today, understanding that we will come back to some of those others that are a little bit further down the prioritization list, but we will certainly be following up on that. And uh, we heard uh, the status at the public health districts over this last week, there's been tremendous activity. Thank you again to Amy Gamut for that. And then finally, we finished with safety, vaccine safety and effectiveness with Dr. Bridges. So a lot of great information there. In terms of action items and next steps, we do not have any formal action items for you at this time. But of course, as we keep hearing at every meeting, this work is moving quickly and fluidly. So if something, if a need emerges, we will le uh, let you know and communicate new information to you as things go on as well. Uh, we will at this point plan to continue CVAC meetings uh, through February 2021. That is our best guess at this point. And our next meeting is scheduled for January 8th. Uh, same time as the Friday, 12 to 2 p.m. Next slide. All right, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Burgess and Elke for closing remarks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, and um, I'm sure you all have also looked at the calendar. We, we may need to have weekly meetings to get through some of our work, but our next two Fridays are holidays. Next Friday is uh, December 25th, and the one after that is January 1st. So January 8th is our next feasible meeting, but just be prepared for the possibility that we might have to uh, do some weekly meetings to get caught up on those groups as our vaccine supply uh, uh, comes along. So uh, just echo my thanks and uh, watch your email for information between meetings. We saw a lot of comments in the chat that we'll be paying attention to and responding to. And uh, I'll turn it over to Elke. Great, thanks Patrice. I know that our uh, audio and visual keeps cutting out. Uh, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, just echoing the same thing, we, we do really appreciate all the input and conversation. None of these decisions are easy. That's why we're bringing you all in to help us make some of these decisions. Um, and so we look forward to the next conversation with you all. And please stay tuned. I anticipate that we will, to keep things moving forward, need to send you information, potentially um, action items in between meetings as well. So with that, Thank you all very much for a great meeting today. And I'm sorry that we couldn't quickly get through everything, but we will hopefully have more efficiency and, and um, better opportunities going forward. And happy holidays, everybody. Thank yes. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.